let's take a look at the SSH grant, uh, the SSH grant, which is uh, kind of the core of everything else we're going to be talking about tonight. So normally when I work in a terminal, I mean, this is a terminal. We talked about it last week. You can look up the lectures if you want to know more about all the cool things you can do in a bash shell like this. Uh, when I type a command, it, it runs on my local machine. When I type ls, it's reflecting my local file system, and so on and so forth. Now, often, you want to connect to a remote machine to do work. Um, you have a big processing server somewhere. You have a shared server somewhere where you and all your team's working. You can get, a, as you can imagine, I mean, there are multiple ways of doing this. On Windows, you have things like remote desktop, which load a full separate GUI when you connect to something. The advantage of doing a lot of your work in the shell is it's very lightweight to have a remote shell connection to another server someplace else. So whereas remote desktop, you have to have a pretty robust internet connection, there's still some overhead to using it and stuff like that, SSH tends to be pretty streamlined. I can SSH into another machine and I don't even, I mean, it's just as fast for the most part as if I were on my local machine. So SSH is what we call the secure shell handler. What it is, is it essentially is a way for me to open up a shell like the one I'm in now on another machine. This is a pretty common operation, so common so that a reminder of what machine you're currently working on is built into the default prompt on most machines. So Raven is the name of my local machine. When I connect to another machine, this is going to change because now it's just there to kind of remind me every time I type in a command, it's running on whatever machine is specified there. So CU operates a series of, um, well, the format of the SH, SSH command is basically you do SSH and then you specify a username at some server address. Um, so you obviously need a remote server to connect to. Uh, there's a number of uh, other things the SSH command can do as well. The man page tells you all about it, but this is kind of the core usage. So CU operates a number of servers as part of the C cell, and these are remote work servers, so you can SSH into these from anywhere in the world and work on them. The name of the servers are all LRA, so you guys can use these. Uh, so it'll be LRA-01. In theory, it's 0, 1 through 4, although 3 and 4 are down right now. I only was getting to 1 and 2 earlier. So pick 1 or 2, and then it's lra.cs.colorado.edu. And if you just run the command like this, it needs a username it's going to assume your local username. So if I run the command like this, it's the same as me running as a sailor at here. Now, a sailor isn't my UTLN at. It's your UTLN that you guys will need to, so your standard, whatever you use to log in everywhere else, is the same thing. Your identity key username is the same username you use here. So my identity key username is actually sailor A. So I would type in my identity key username at lrod01.cs.colorado.edu. This is the same credentials you'd use to log into the physical machines if you went and sat down in the CSL right now. If I run that, uh, good, I'm glad I haven't connected to this recently. So the first time you ever connect to an SSH session, you're to a, the first time you ever connect to a computer from one computer, uh, you're going to get a message like this. SSH uses a system called uh, public key cryptography that we're not really going to go into too deep tonight, but the point is when you do something over SSH, it gets encrypted on one end and decrypted on the other. So this is a secure connection. Someone listening to all the wireless traffic in this room isn't, they're going to be able to see my encrypted messages go by, but they're not going to be able to decode them and actually know what I'm doing. Part of that encryption algorithm is verifying that lred-01.cs.com.edu is actually the machine that I think it is, right? It's not someone pretending to be lred-01.cs.com.edu. On the internet, when you connect to your bank's website and it's an HTTPS connection, you've probably seen like it turns green in the upper corner of your bar, and or it gives you a warning. If you go to our Moodle site right now, it gives you a nice warning because we don't have it configured properly. Um, the point is, there's basically a way to securely verify the computer. What this is telling me is, this is that computer's secure fingerprint, and it's asking me to say, is this in fact the computer you want to connect to? Now, unlike the nice internet system that has a way of automatically turning green or red and determining if this is correct for me, I don't actually know, right? I haven't memorized whether or not this long streak of sequence of digits actually is the correct one for Elbrus. So there's a couple ways around this. Um, 
what it's asking me to do is basically save this to my memory as the correct one. So if I'm reasonably confident that LRED S01 is his RDD is correct right now, I can type yes. It'll then warn me in the future if this ever changes. So that's better than nothing, right? I mean, so if someone's spoofing this right now, I'm screwed. But if it's correct right now and someone hijacks it next week, this will catch it. The other thing I could do is, if I were really paranoid, I could email whoever ran LRED Auto on this his card to you. I could have them send me a copy of the ballot string, and I could just do a visual compare, and I could manually compare them, right? Uh, nobody does that, but you can do that. And, you know, if this were something that was really sensitive, we would. Right now, we're just going to go ahead and type yes. It's going to say, cool, we're going to permanently trust that, and now it's only going to warn us if it actually, uh, if that ever changes. It then immediately closed my connection, probably because I took way too long to hit yes. Uh, there's generally a timeout period there. So I'm going to repeat that process again. I'm just going to hit up, load the last command. And if I do it again, now I'm going to get prompted for my password. And again, this is your identity passwords. Oh, I'm fine. Cool. So I put in mine, and it go ahead, and now I'm logged in. You will notice. Both my username changed because my user, my identity username is Sailor A instead of A Sailor. So the A swiped around. And we're no longer on the computer called Raven. We're now on a computer called LRA-01, which is where we expect to be because that's where we just connected to. So now, anytime I run a command, if I run ls, I'm actually running it on that other server. You'll notice the ls output here differs from the ls output a minute ago. It's similar because they're both Ubuntu machines and you have a similar structure in your home directory. But this is now my home directory on that Elro machine. Questions on doing that? Anyone running into snacks? So this is the same directory that we'd see if we logged in on that computer? Yes, uh, that's not always true. So and it's true in this case. So when you walk into a computer there, you're not logging into Elro. You're logging into one of the machines. I mean, each of those machines has its own name. Right. Elro is like the big one sitting in the back room. But we use a system that basically your home directory is mirrored, right? it's not mirrored, it's, this is actually a networked directory. So this is actually on another machine and they all connect to that. So yes, you would see the same thing, but it's not because you're actually, you're, you're actually on a different machine, but they're part of the same, they're both using the same NFS to share. But if you could actually go walk up to Elrond and log in, then yeah, this would be exactly what you'd see there. Uh, it says that my account has been uh, expired. So you need to go back to that website we went to earlier and if you, re if you go through the sign-up process again, it expires at every semester, so you got to redo that every semester. It generally only takes like 30 seconds to activate, so you can do that, repeat this process, and it should be good to go. Any other questions? Okay, so that's SSH. I can now go, I can work on this server, so on and so forth, right? Like I can start coding, I can compile, I mean, you can do it pretty much anything on here, you can do it on the other machines in the other room. A few useful commands that used to be way more useful back in the day and now are kind of limited to usefulness in this situation is things you never have to do on your work here. Like, if you're doing performance analysis, realize you're now on a shared server, right? There could be other people logged into this machine with us and what they're doing could be affecting the performance, so on and so forth. There's a command W. Uh, it'll print out the name of any other users currently logged in. So, apparently there's no homework due tomorrow or there would be like 40 people logged in right now there's only two people on this server right now i'm the second one is this someone else in here and he's the first one so we are the only two people logged into our right now but if you ever want to get a feel for how many people are on the server you can do something like that if you're doing work that's really compute intensive like it's going to take 40 minutes to compile your code and you notice that there's 100 other people on this server uh, both for your sake and for the sake of 100 other people on the server it would be good to like try one of the try connecting one of the other LRA servers instead, or come back later, because these are shared servers. You have to be mindful of the fact that other people are sharing the resources right now. If I type W, it shows me four users. So if I type it again, now there's four. So uh, oh no, there's still not four. So if you do it right now, there's oh there we go. Okay. No. So there's probably people logging on. I mean this this changes pretty quickly. So I could keep running W. Um, so there's actually a command called watch, and what watch does is it reruns the W, reruns whatever command you type after it. In this case, every two seconds, I can tell it to do any time. But so if I do watch W, we can like sit here and see as this changes every two seconds, right? Or it doesn't. And then I can hit Q or Control C, we'll close that. So just in general, anytime you want to like run some command and have the computer just rerun it for you automatically so you can monitor it, you watch as the tool for you. 
followed by whatever command you're going to look up. And if you look at the man page for watch, you can turn it down to run every tenth of a second or whatever, right? Two seconds is just the uh, So we won't get too deep into this. There's, there's, realize that Unix systems were originally designed for time-sharing computers. So they come from an era when no one had their own computer. Your university had one big computer like this, and you had what was called a dumb terminal, which was basically a keyboard, a monitor, and a modem. And the only thing it could do was connect to make, make a remote connection like this. So there's a lot of commands that are designed for working in kind of this shared computing environment, um, W being one of them, right? You never run W on your laptop because you're the only person that's ever logged into your laptop. There are commands that allow you to like chat other users, right? I mean, there was there was an entire ecosystem of commands for this environment um, that we don't really use anymore. But if you want to dive into it, we could actually do things like send messages to these other users right now and have like a little chat conversation back and forth and so on and so forth. And you could feel like it was the golden age of early computing in the 1970s, and everyone thought this was the coolest thing ever, and it was the coolest thing ever because the internet didn't exist yet. Um, and this was like instantaneous communication where otherwise we were going to call someone and it lets you talk to all your coworkers who are on the same machine as you. And it was a blast. Nobody does that anymore. The old days are gone. Now we just use Gchat. There's no command line. It's all together. So questions on the basic SSH, watch, etc. Were you able to get it working? Mm -hmm. Cool. So when you're done using your SSH session, you can just type in exit. And you'll see it's going to close my connection, and now I'm going to be back on my regular terminal. But it's pretty transparent, right? There's no, it's, it's other than the fact that this changes, the fact that I'm working on a remote machine is, is really, it's built in at a pretty low level, so it's a really easy thing to do. Um, obviously, a few notes, right? When I'm on Elra, I can't use the sudo command. I am not, and my user is not an administrator on that machine, right? I have no ability to do anything that requires root access. I can't install software. I can't remove software. I mean, for obvious reasons, right? That computer exists for a whole bunch of people to use. If everyone could go doing root things, which are considered the things that can break it for everyone else, it would be broken all the time because that's what people do. Um, so do understand the limitations. You don't have root access. If you need root access, you need to like build some custom software and install it. If you need root access, you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to have to call up the C cell administrator who's Matt Monitor is going to die, tell him why you need that software, and he'll install it for you. Um, but beyond that, it's a good place if you need to do work uh, for certain types of things. It works well. You have about three or four gigabytes. I wonder if they'll tell us. Sometimes this is up this, sometimes it's not. Let me log back in. OK, so it's not to work. Um, never mind. Sometimes you can type in on shared machines, there's a command called quota that basically, there's a limit on the amount of disk space I'm allowed to use on this machine at any time. Often quota will tell you what that limit is, how much you have left. They don't have it set up. So, but there is a limit. It's just not telling me. I think you each have about five gigabytes. So you can essentially store five gigabytes worth of files there, and they will exist there as long as you're a student here. So it's a nice place if you need to do some persistent work if you have you know, a crappy little netbook, and you can't do any real coding on it, but you can fire up SSH because it takes almost no resources at all. Or if you have a Chromebook, right? You can't really code on your Chromebook, but Chromebook has an SSH client. So you can fire up your basically a web browser-based SSH client, connect to this machine, do real programming while you're sitting on your little $200 ARM-based Chromebook or your iPad or what have you. Um, get in here and do your work. So SSH is useful for a huge number of reasons. You'll also be in situations where you're running like a web server, and you need to SSH into that server because it's, you don't just need a place to do work, you need that place, right? You need to go change a file on that specific server, so on and so forth. So in real life, when we have these big server farms, we don't have keyboards and monitors for all of them. Almost none of them have keyboards and monitors. We connect to all of them via SSH, right? If you need to monitor, if you need to change something on a server, you have one computer with a keyboard and monitor, and from that computer, you can connect to all of your other computers on the network. So questions on base SSH. OK. So SSH will actually do, uh, SSH becomes then the back end for a whole series of other tools. The kind of key being SSH does set up this secure connection. And now we can use that secure connection to do other things, like copy files between computers, run commands on other computers. You can even do, so the SSH command itself, I'm not going to go into this tonight, but 
SSH will do a thing called, uh, you can have what's called like an SSH proxy or SSH forwarding, where essentially you open up an SSH connection to like LRA. Only I think LRA maybe disables you from doing this. But generally you open up an SSH connection to something like LRA, and you can tell your computer to send all of your internet traffic through that SSH connection and then actually to go onto the internet via LRA instead of via your own machine. So then if you go to a website, it looks like you're browsing from LRA instead of your own machine. A couple of places this is handy. Uh, if you're sitting in a place like a coffee shop and you're on the wireless network and it's not secure, generally anyone can see your traffic, right? It's not that hard. We'll do another session on traffic sniffing sometime. Um, if you connect to a website that says HTTPS, you're fine. That gets encrypted on its own. But if you connect to any other website that's not HTTPS, anyone else sitting in that coffee shop can see exactly what you're doing. If you want to prevent that, you could open up an SSH tunnel to something like LRA or to your own computer at your house. It's really the best way to do it that you know is secure. It'll then encrypt all your internet traffic, send it through that tunnel, and it won't go onto the internet until it gets to your house. So you can essentially tunnel all of your traffic through a secure connection, avoiding the whole insecurity of the wireless network and wherever you are, and only decrypt it in a place that you know is secure, like your own living room where no one's sniffing your traffic. Um, the other place it's handy is when you're traveling in Europe and you want to watch Hulu. Hulu and Netflix and stuff are blocked for any IP addresses not coming from the United States. So if you just start forwarding all your traffic through your server back at home, then all of a sudden, I mean, it doesn't actually know where you are, it just knows where your IP address is. So if I tunnel all my traffic through my server in my living room, I can watch Hulu just like I'm in the United States, because as far as Hulu is concerned, I am in the United States. That final connection is coming from a server in the United States. So there's other reasons you would do this too. Sometimes you have like a private website on a server that's not publicly exposed, so you need to SSH forward your traffic just to that server so you can connect to the website on that server because you are not allowed to connect to that website through the public internet. Um, so there's a bunch of places you would use this, but SSH port forwarding is what it's called, or SSH tunneling. Um, if you Google SSH tunneling, you can read all about how you can set this up and do it. It's really not that hard, um, but that's all I'm going to say about it here. Clear on that? 